Do you think you found the skeleton? How would you tell people that was You first, first, first. How would you tell us? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yay! Ah, I'm dropping really sorry. I mean, you should do it if you have a Twitter. Yes, you don't have to. It free will, right? Do what you want. I just hear some chump talking in the background. Oh, the crap, that's me. But can you see his mouth move? That's the real question. Ben, <laughs> stop pulling a Kyle. Well, I don't hate myself, so I can't be Kyle. Of course I can hear you. Says Bent to nobody. Did you try unmuting yourself? Just use all of your microphones. Uh, you got real close. So, yeah, the microphone is connected. I can hear him when he's talking. You guys in the chat can't. That is mostly lame. Is there a chance that you're just a figment of my imagination? He said yes, but like, was it him that said it or me? Like, who would know? <laughs> There's a lot to critique. Hey, maybe you guys can hear me now. I don't actually know. Hey, he can hear you on the video. It works. You can hear me on the video? Yes. Oh, awesome. All right, so it turns out that, um, yeah, YouTube only actually accepts some of your audio channels when you decide to split your audio channel on OBS into multiple channels. I don't know what just happened to my avatar, but that's okay. I'll fix it later. So, uh, yeah. Well, off to a rocky start, but it yeah. only took four minutes to fix. Sorry about that, everyone. Not, not the start I would have preferred, but what are you going to do? Yeah, but four minutes isn't that bad. It could have been worse. It could have been 45 minutes. Like, the thing I experienced earlier today. Okay. All right. Well, 
my you're you're not even really late because I'm late apparently because no one could hear me for the first four ish minutes. So anyway, um, we are going to go through 100 years of dinosaurs in film because I realized that in 2014 we hit the 100th anniversary of the first on-screen dinosaur. Nice. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the first dinosaur movie ever made. And then we are going to do one movie for every decade after that. And we're going to talk about the movie itself. We're going to talk about um, the depiction of the dinosaurs in the movie. And also, uh, which I said something which you guys apparently didn't hear because, um, yeah, I'm, I was muted. Uh, so uh, it was not a, a stop motion dino film. It was animated, actually. It was hand-drawn. Uh, so, another thing is that I'm a goblin today because originally I was supposed to have a different goblin on stream and I was going to be a dinosaur. That was the original plan. But, Cheshire is not feeling well. So later on, I'm going to ask everyone who has a Twitter account to go wish her, uh, you know, get better soon. Yeah. So I went to Twitter and tweeted her to get well soon. Is that good enough? Yeah, that's fine. So let's uh, let's look at our first movie. So first up, we have Gertie the Dinosaur from 1914. As far as I can tell, this is the first movie to feature a dinosaur ever screened anywhere. <clears throat> the plot's pretty simple. It starts off with some establishing shots of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, and um, then it moves on to some men sitting in a room with a bet where one of them says that he can have a cartoon dinosaur do whatever he wants it to on the sheet of paper that he has up on the wall. And they all say, oh, no, you can't. And then the camera zooms in on the first frame of this animation, or I guess this animation, and then um, it cuts to the actual animation itself, which is a simple line drawing with basically no shading. Um, and yeah. So it is the first ever dinosaur thing. So uh, it's pretty crude. It's also famous for being the first animation ever to use keyframes, which is a concept that's still used in animation, where you set up certain frames where you know exactly where you want everything. And then either the computer nowadays or previously uh, other artists would fill in the frames in between to get you from point A to point B. So that is how this film was made, and it was the first one made that way. Uh, it's pretty simple. Gertie the Dinosaur comes out, does some tricks, um, throws a mammoth into the into the pond. It's honestly, by today's standards, it's really boring. But <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to pretend. But let's talk a little bit about the the, uh, the depiction of the dinosaur. So the anatomy is way off. This is supposed to be some kind of brontosaurus or something, according to like the producers. But clearly, um, it isn't. Like, there's just no way that you can realistically tell me that that's what that animal is supposed to be, is a brontosaurus, because it just doesn't look like one. So, uh, yeah, specifically, uh, the face has no definition. There's just this blob of a face on here, and it's sort of like, what what is even going on right now? It just reminds me of like how I would draw a dinosaur <laughs> if I got better at drawing dinosaurs, but not much better. Right. Because my goodness. Yeah. Um, another big thing is that the feet are way too big. If you look at this foot, it splays out. I mean, it just down here and um, yeah, it shouldn't do that. Uh, those feet of sauropods were pretty columnar and they, stayed about the same width the whole way down. Because ultimately, the only thing su that's actually supporting the weight, and the best way to support the weight of that such a large creature, is if it's supported directly vertically. Because then anything that kind of splays out is having to support extra weight, and it's not its strongest uh, orientation. Because, you know, bones are very, very hard to break compressing them. Oh, hey, I have a weird hand. What's going on with that? It's a goblin hand. It's automatically weird. Huh. It is extra weird, though. Yeah, I think I, I think I fixed it. No, no, maybe a little bit. Twisted around itself. Eh, whatever. Um. Uh. So, Dark Knight's apologetics. Uh, the reason I'm a I'm a goblin today 
is um, I have uh, Chesh was supposed to come here, and she's our token goblin, but she wasn't feeling well today. So we're gonna later on. I'm gonna have to ask everyone to say get well soon to Chesh because yeah, poor Chesh was supposed to be here. Anyway, um, also. This suffers from a problem. I wrote down here, mammoths weren't around too long after the non-avian dinosaurs died. So this is a problem that happens a lot in um, a lot of dinosaur media, especially in the 20th century. Which is to say that all of the extinct animals throughout all of time and space all lived in the same place at the same time, and it was prehistoric time. So the whole thing is just one big mashup of prehistoric animals. And that started pretty early because um, I think, I, I think to a large extent still, but especially until very recently, the public kind of had this idea that the time of the dinosaurs and the mammoths and the cavemen and whatever was all just one old big old time. And uh, movie producers are not really interested in changing that impression. So, well, that was uh, 1914. But. Our next movie is going to be 1925's The Lost World. So we're still in the uh, era of silent movies and black and white. So this movie had no sound, but it was based on the book, The Lost World, which was, uh, now I'm blanking. Ben, who was that written by? Um, it was written by Allosaurus. That no. can't be right. I don't know. How would I know? Because you have a Google machine. I'm not Duke, but I can... Uh, I can okay. So, uh, this is a fairly short movie. I think it's only about an hour-ish long. And uh, it might have been Doyle, uh, Ugly German Truths. I'm not... I just can't remember for the life of me who it was. But, uh, so this movie... This movie was uh, fairly short, and the plot basically goes... There's this crazy scientist... Um, crazy scientist who said oh there were living dinosaurs on this plateau in south america and no one believes him but there's this news reporter who's desperate for a story and who also has a fiance who apparently won't marry him until he does something exciting and dangerous and he figures that an expedition to the jungle of south america might just be that so uh he decides to go to this lecture to get a good story and to also potentially find out if this will be a thing that will let his, you know, fiance not hate him, I guess. And yeah, it was Arthur Conan Doyle. So it was Arthur Conan Doyle. There a, you go. It's a Sherlock Holmes dinosaur. Yeah, Sherlock Holmes uh, is definitely not in this movie, but we can imagine that he was sitting back in London, listening to the dispatches from the jungle. I don't know. Um. So they find this plateau, and they bring along the daughter of the last explorer who was there because her father went missing. They find his corpse. They find a bunch of dinosaurs. The tree that they used to get from where they could climb over to the plateau breaks, so they have to come up with some new way to get down. They fashion some rope. Everyone's safe. There are dinosaurs in the middle of the movie, because that's what the danger was on the plateau. Um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> sorry, I'm reading what Maya said. Ben yeah. Hovind, uh, found your request. Welcome, Thank man. you for not making me search Facebook for people unrelated to Kent Hovind. <laughs> Well, my Facebook is not <laughs> Benthoven. It's my actual real name. Right. Wait, your real name isn't Benthoven? It, well, my real, real name is Benthoven, but okay. my real name is not. And then Wait. my fake name is also Benthoven. Are you even relate? Are you even not related to Kent Hovind? The you- Benthoven no relation part, I think that means that I'm not actually related, but I'm not positive okay. because we're both apes, even though he would deny it. It's true, you are both apes. Sure we're related, even though there's no relation. Okay. It gets confusing. So, uh, this movie shows a big problem for a lot of dinosaur movies, really up until the 90s, which is all the theropods are all kind of standing like kangaroos. Everybody's dragging their tail. It happens in pretty much every media depiction of dinosaurs up until very recently. And in fact, it even includes some recent depictions of dinosaurs. So, what are you going to do? Um, there is some nice, one nice bit though, which is, uh, the main antagonistic meat eating dinosaur is Allosaurus. And actually it's depicted attacking a sauropod, which is most likely the preferred prey of Allosaurus. Because when we find sauropod bones and things like the Morrison formation, they often have Allosaurus bite marks. And Allosaurus seems to have some adaptations like the extremely like hyper 
opening jaw that were designed for eating um, sauropods. So it's nice that they picked a dinosaur that probably actually ate sauropods. I don't know if this was an intentional move or if it just happened to be the way it is, but it was still nice to see. Um, one big problem, though, is in several scenes, the dinosaurs are seen snarling, moving their their lips up and down. And uh, yeah, dinos- no reptiles can do that. Um, the whole flexible lip where you can um, you can do stuff like this. Yeah, that's pretty much just a mammal thing. So that's a bit of a no-no. Oops. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the big inaccuracies there. Um, but it's still a pretty fun movie if you have an extra hour and you don't mind reading all of the dialogue as on-screen cards, because it's silent. Uh, the, copy I f- the copy I found had a nice little soundtrack, but I was missing the film flicker. So I, I also put on some film flicker in the background so it would feel like a more authentic silent movie viewing. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, well, what can I, I say? it made it significantly better. It did, actually. It was a lot more fun with the little, little running in the background. Yeah. So we now go on to 1933 with our first movie that actually has sound. And I had not seen the 1933 King Kong in years before I watched it this week in preparation for this episode. Um, and you know what? It's a really good movie. Even the special effects actually hold up surprisingly well. I would say the most impressive thing about this movie is the way that they actually blend the stop motion characters in with the live action elements. Because, um... If you've ever seen any stop motion, you'll know that that's probably the biggest flaw of stop motion is it's very hard to mix the two elements because <clears throat> when stop motion was still very popular, there were not a lot of very uh, complicated or uh, accurate matting techniques. So, you know, they didn't have chroma keys. If you wanted to mat something out, you just had to actually physically block parts of the frame. Um, so, yeah, it was... It was very impressive uh, what they achieved with this movie. I think it's more or less unparalleled in terms of uh, mixing the two elements together. Uh, Let's see. And also, for the time that it was made, they actually seemed to pay a lot of attention to making animals seem reasonably accurate. Uh, Nothing had too many fingers or too many toes. Uh, Everything seemed to be pretty pretty reasonable given uh, the paleontology of the day. Uh, There were some problems, though, like, uh, let's see, the Stegosaurus that is depicted near the beginning of when they land on Skull Island, it is enormous. So if you've ever stood next to a typical Stegosaurus uh, fossil, that's like a mount, a museum mount with a full skeleton, like, uh, Bent, I don't know if you've ever done that. No. But Stegosaurus at its tallest point along the back, if you ignore the spikes, would probably only be about a head taller than you are. Okay. So it's the top of its back is probably at about two ish meters, and then the you know the plates on the back go up a little bit more. But the Stegosaurus depicted in in uh, King Kong is like the size of like a blue whale. It is just enormous. Way too big. Way too big. And the plates have a weird shape to them. They're like squared, cut off things. And uh, Stegosaurus plates should be sort of like a kite shape with a long tapering bit intersecting the back about like halfway down. Um, so the pterosaur does grab someone, and that is something I'm going to talk about. I don't remember if it had too many toes. It's hard to get a pterosaur with too many toes, because most of them actually retained five toes. So, I mean, there's that. Um, there's also a weird bit where there's a sauropod in a swamp. And at the time, that wasn't too unreasonable, because at the time it was thought that sauropods would have had to live primarily in water in order to support their bulk. It was thought that a reptile just couldn't support that much weight. And part of that was because they were reconstructed with sprawling limbs, which we know is wrong, and which actually some other movies got right. But um, yeah, the sauropod in this movie is lives in a swamp, and then it tries to hunt down a human, which is weird. And it's not weird that a sauropod might attack a human, because um, you know we have this idea in our culture that plant-eating animals are docile and peaceful, but they're not. Go Go poke a rhinoceros and see what happens. I mean, it's going to be a bad day, right? 
But would, the rhinoceros not recommend doing that. Right. But the the rhinoceros is probably not gonna go and try and chomp on you. It's gonna gore you with its horn, it's gonna trample you. Similarly, a sauropod would probably not try to bite at you. It would whip you with its tail and try to kick you or trample you. So it's a little bit weird that it's like hunting a human. Um, another big problem is that just like the last movie, we have uh, the lips moving. Dinosaur lips can't move. Uh, they don't have muscles. It's likely that a lot of dinosaurs actually had... Oh, yeah, and, and Nikki points out hippos are violent. Yeah, hippos kill more people every year than crocodiles do in Africa. So... Yeah, they're they're vicious, and their jaws will absolutely crush you. Uh, but yeah, so this movie also has the problem with the the moving jaws, and also it has a scene where a very, an absolutely gigantic pterosaur, but actually one that's probably not too big, considering that uh, Asdarkids could probably get about that big, even though this one looked more like a pteranodon than an actual Asdarkid. That's, I mean, you know, okay, fine. Uh, but yeah, it tried to pick someone up with their feet. Pterosaurs couldn't lift with their feet. Their toes didn't curl around far enough. And their feet were extremely weak. Really, the only thing the feet could do was actually just help them walk along the ground. And uh, pterosaurs actually took off with their front legs, pushing down. Oh, oh I'm not sure what happened there. Anyway, uh, pushing down with their front legs in order to launch themselves up. So, yeah, the whole pterosaur... Uh, carrying people in their feet is a bit ridiculous although it's even more ridiculous when it happens in um, Jurassic World where normal sized pteranodons pick up an adult human woman and it's just like no they couldn't have even done that with their beaks like that's way too much weight um, so yeah I, <laughs> I don't know what happened there uh, yeah so, and this is also an excellent movie I definitely recommend go see uh, go see like it's in theaters, right? Find a copy of King Kong from 1933 and watch it through. Um, also, another interesting thing is if you've seen Kong Skull Island, you'll probably remember the skull the skull crawlers. Do you remember those, Ben? I did not see that. Oh, so, no. so uh, in Kong Skull Island, there are these two legged reptilian monsters that um, come after King Kong and the human characters. Well, I thought originally that that was just made up for that movie. And I didn't know that that was actually a thing that went all the way back to Kong 1933. Because in that movie, you see a little two-legged lizard monster crawling up a cliff before the humans shoot it down. And it looks very much like the skull crawlers from the movie. So I have to double check, but I'm pretty sure that those skull crawlers were actually based on that lizard monster from King Kong 1933. So that's a little, little bit of movie trivia. It's a pretty subtle callback. I mean... I yeah, most people who saw that did not see the original. So. Uh, that's probably true. Although it's a very good movie, and I really highly recommend go see King Kong from 1933. It's really good. Uh, so <clears throat> now in 1940 we come to Fantasia, the Rite of Spring, and I for you pedants out there, yeah, I know technically 1940 is the same decade, but the other movies that started that had four in the in ten spot weren't as interesting as this one. So. I mean, I'm okay with it. It has a four instead of a three. And yeah, get bent. I'm related yeah. to Kent Hovind, so, you know. Uh, wait, you are? <gasps> wait, no, I'm not. No relation. <laughs> so, um, this is another... So, with Kong Skull, or with King Kong, I'm not really picking on the whole animals from all over the place in time, because this is supposed to be a modern setting where how exactly these dinosaurs exist here is not really made clear. And so... You know, you can come up with explanations as to why all these things have persisted and come together in Skull Island or whatever. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm not going to pick on King Kong, but I am going to pick on it here, which is animals from all over the place. Because the Rite of Spring from Net, uh, Disney's Fantasia, it was one song, they used the Rite of Spring, and they set it to be what was supposed to be the... Uh, like the end Cretaceous extinction event. This was before the um, asteroid hypothesis really gained a lot of favor. But the problem is that they've got animals from all different periods all being depicted as being around at the end Cretaceous, which they weren't. In fact, this theropod here on the right, it's not even clear what it's supposed to be. It's got three fingers... When normally in media, when you see a three-fingered dinosaur, you can usually reasonably assume um, Allosaurus. 
but it also looks more like a typical Tyrannosaurus from a cartoon at the time. So I don't, I don't really know. Um, but also just like uh, King Kong has sauropods and swamps, including very sprawling legs, which is just very inaccurate. And um, I believe by the 1940s, sauropods were being reconstructed with columnar legs. So that's a, that's, that's no good. Um, the, the theropod also seems to have fangs. Is that what you're seeing there, Ben? Th- those look like fangs to you, right? Like canine teeth? Well, it might be a vampire. I mean, it's hard to tell. They do look extra long, though. Right. Well, the problem is that that's not a thing that any theropod would have. That's a that's a mammal thing. Canine teeth are a specifically mammalian feature. You don't get them in dinosaurs. The closest you get to something like that um, would be like Heterodontosaurus with its little tusk-like teeth. Or even in Tyrannosaurus, the uh, the premaxillary teeth were slightly differently shaped, but it didn't have fangs like this in, under any circumstance. So, yeah, not, yeah. Um, let's see. It also has the end Cretaceous uh, extinction event being due to essentially climate change, but with extreme warming. Problem there, uh, yeah, just an awkward preteen Rex that needs some dental work. <laughs> the problem with uh. This is that um, the end Cretaceous was actually during a period of cooling and not a period of warming. The global climate was actually getting cooler and cooler. And towards the end, there was significant snowfall in um, the Arctic and Antarctic regions of the planet. There were still no permanent ice caps, so it was still significantly warmer than it is today. But I can guarantee you that the cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs was not that it got too hot. That is not it. I promise. Um... So another thing that's a bit of a pet peeve of mine is epoxipital horns on Tyrannosaurus, which is little spiky horns all around the frill that you see in a lot of Triceratops depictions. Those did not exist in the adults. So those are almost always wrong when you're looking at an adult Triceratops. And like I talked about before, sprawling legs on the sauropods. I will say, however, that um, it still has a lot of good qualities as a film. There's a lot of dramatic scenes. Uh, the music is obviously good, and it fits the depictions well, and you get a really good sense of sort of uh, emotion of like this conflict with the t- the whatever the meat eater is. Um, you get a good sense of the the violence of it trying to hunt down the Stegosaurus. Um, you get a lot. A, it's a very cool depiction of like the the extinction, and there's a sense of desperation about it. And the sense of uh, weariness that all the dinosaurs have is they're just plodding along to try and find some water. And uh, yeah, it's very, very effective from just a filmmaking standpoint. The framing of the shots is nice. The atmosphere is nice. The weathering effect, the weather effects are cool. Overall, it's a fun watch, even if it's wildly inaccurate by today's standards. So yeah, check out Fantasia, The Rite of Spring sometime. So yeah. Uh, yeah, sprawling legs needs like the lizard type stance where the legs project out from the side and then down. Yeah. And next we're going to come to one of my favorite movies of all time, which I know Bent has seen. <laughs> and that is Godzilla from 1954 or 1955, if you watched it in the United States when it came out or on, as it was available pretty much exclusively in the United States for a long time. It's only been in the last few years that you've actually been able to, in the United States, easily get a hold of a dub or uh, or subtitled version of the original Japanese version. I have seen it so. twice now. Well, there you go. So, yeah. In the movie, Godzilla is said to be a dinosaur. And so I'm counting this. Uh, in part because it's one of my favorite movies. So, I mean, what am I going to do, right? Okay. Uh, but if Godzilla is a dinosaur, he's a, go- he's a dinosaur that doesn't really look like a dinosaur. So for one thing, he has ears. I don't know if you can tell, but right up there, there's ears sticking out. No, dinosaurs don't have little sticky out ears like these. Just, nope. Those are also <laughs> a mammal thing. Uh, let's see. He's got that heterodont dentition like a mammal, like we talked about with the, the dinosaur in Fantasia, where he's got fangs. You can see them right here. No. Dinosaurs don't have those. Uh, Let's see. He's got the wrong number of toes. So he's got four toes, which uh, the only theropods that had four toes that they actually walked on 
are um, rather late and advanced uh, Therizinosaurs, which Godzilla doesn't seem to be because he doesn't have the gigantic finger claws that a Therizinosaur would have. And he's also got weird back plates, like a Stegosaurus, which is also not something that a Therizinosaur would have. Uh, let's see. He's also got the wrong number of fingers, so he's got three fingers and a thumb for a total of four digits. The only dinosaurs with four digits, they were they were the correct digits that uh, he has, but the fourth digit was always greatly reduced, essentially being useless. And dinosaurs pretty much always had three inline digits, at least as far as theropods go. Also, Godzilla is way too big. No dinosaur ever approached 50 meters tall. But could that have been from the radiation, though? I mean, that's the explanation it, that was given in the movie. But the thing is that 50 meters tall is biologically impossible. You can't get okay. to be 50 meters tall. Not even with, like, super radiation? Right, even or with like super radiation. Ultra radiation? You would need your bones to, like, be made out of titanium or something. Like, maybe Wolverine could do it. But, yeah. Okay. Um, so, also, um, in the movie, it said that the dinosaurs died out two million years ago. I did mention that. Yeah, yeah, which is just, just way, way off. It is extremely off. Uh, the end Cretaceous. That. Yeah, we um, talked about the Sea Bad Show when we did this movie. Yep, yeah, we did this movie for the Sea Bad Show. Uh, I believe the panel then was me, Bent, and Duke. I don't think Chesh was there for that. So, um,. Yeah, and also, you know what? Now that we're in the 50s, which is about halfway through the century of dinosaurs in film, I would like everyone who can to please at Cheshire Vic and wish her, you know, a speedy recovery, say, so get well soon or something like that, because she was originally supposed to be here, but she's not feeling well, so I, uh, I, I'd, like, I'd like it if people could cheer her up as a sort of a consolation prize, because obviously being on the stream... Is the real prize, but you know, what are you gonna do? Oh yeah, for sure. Right. So if you can send her a uh, some get well messages, because I I hate it when pe when my friends are sick. No, never any fun. It's alright if you don't do Twitter. I mean, you know, if you don't, just if you can't, it. you can't. Just get a Twitter. It's free. It is free, but I'm not gonna do ask what anyone. I get it. <laughs> use it for a couple months. Stop using it for eight years, and then very rarely tweet again. No. Um. So does the the like, Godzilla have thecodont teeth or acrodont teeth? Actually, I don't know. Uh, there is a scene where you can see his skull in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2, but I don't remember enough about that scene to answer the question of exactly how his teeth come. But given that the skull looked very mammalian and mammals tend to have thecodont teeth, if I had to guess, I'd say he probably had thecodont teeth. So, yeah. Hey, hey, don't get me wrong. Twitter sucks. But still, if you have it, go wish Cheshire Vic a speedy recovery. Uh, let's see. Next, we finally get to some color. With 1 Million Years B.C. from 1966. A movie about cavemen fighting dinosaurs. Because... Why not? Just... Why not, right? Um... Yeah. And yeah, I, look, I'm Bruce. I know that um, Godzilla was made at a time where there's a lot of myth and rumor regarding radiation in Japan. And I'm not commenting that any of this makes it a bad film. I'm just saying that as far as accuracy of a depiction of a dinosaur goes, Godzilla does very poorly. I happen to think it does very well in almost every other aspect of filmmaking. I'm a big fan of Godzilla. So, yes. Yep. Yes, I have been trying to get all of my friends to watch Godzilla movies for years now. And it, all it took was convincing me to start a movie channel with you where we review movies or yep. do commentary on movies. Yep, and then suddenly Ben's on board and for now, doing every single now, one. All these movies you wanted me to watch with you, including every Godzilla, suddenly I want to watch them. Yep. So Hey, welcome back, Luca. All right, so uh, let's see. Uh, a million years BC, the main characters are all cave folk, I guess, cave people. I don't know. Um, they live in a world with dinosaurs and also with, as we'll get into, giant force perspective monsters that aren't dinosaurs, but are supposed to be depicted as dinosaurs. Um, the 
the the stop motion is it's fairly good in this movie. Um, actually, all the movies that I have that have stop motion, the stop motion is is pretty good. Um, so it centers around this particular caveman and this woman from a different tribe, and none of it's in English. There's dialogue, but it's in a made up gibberish caveman language, and it's actually kind of hard to follow if I'm being honest. <laughs> Mostly because I was watching it for the dinosaur depictions and not any of the plot. So I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to what the humans were doing. And what they were doing was shouting nonsense at each other and getting into fights with dinosaurs. So, I mean, whatever. Uh, But, so, some of the issues with 1 million years BC. And also, I picked this because um, the the pinup art that came out of this was extremely popular throughout the 60s because it... um, featured Raquel Welch in a fur bikini. And it became one of the top-selling pinup photos of all time. So this movie is pretty much famous just because of pictures of Raquel Welch in her costume. So there you go. I've uh, uh, seen that picture. It's a good one. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's there's a reason it's one of the most popular pinup pictures of all time. It's got a, it's a classic a, picture. It is. It's got a dynamic pose. She looks like... Like, she's got an interesting expression. Obviously, Raquel Welch was a beautiful woman. There's a, a lot of reasons as to why that's a, a, a well-known picture. But um, non-avian dinosaurs were gone way before a million years ago. And Homo sapiens weren't around a million years ago either. So basically, all of the major entities in this movie are wrong for the time that it says it's set in. Yeah, it's just like, why call it one million years B.C.? Why not just call it prehistoric made up time? I don't know. Actually, the director was asked about um, the objections of, you know, paleontologists and whatnot. And he said, you know what? I don't make my movies for college professors who probably don't want to see this type of movie anyway. I make it for general audiences who want to see people fighting dinosaurs. And it's like, well, yeah, I guess that's fair. Uh, but also... At one point, one of the, quote, dinosaurs is just literally a male green iguana in forced perspective, which doesn't look like a dinosaur. I mean, like, really, not even a little. It just doesn't. So, yeah, I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. I guess it was cheap. And also, there were giant turtles. There were, like, elephant-sized turtles. Why? I don't know. That's never a thing that existed. They're putting the fiction in science fiction. I guess. But one of the things is that the reason I can see why they use the green iguana is because they just filmed an iguana. But the giant turtle is actually a stop motion creation that would have been expensive to make and animate. So why not just make an actual thing? Instead of making up a giant turtle monster. I don't know. Again, there's a triceratops with those epoxipitals that I already talked about, which is annoying because... Adult Triceratops don't have those. And, of course, it was too big. An adult Triceratops is a very big animal, but it's not as big as this movie has it. And so I noticed a trend that a lot of animals in these movies get made bigger to seem more dramatic. Uh, So the main antagonist of the film is actually a Ceratosaurus, which is nice, because that's my normal avatar. Ceratosaurus. I appreciate it. Uh, But it's still a bit too big. Its arms are... uh, Or or maybe it's armsed. I was supposed to say arms, sorry, uh, are too flexible and it's got the wrong uh, posture and also doesn't have the brow horns. Ceratosaurus is well known for the, the nose horn. It's what the name means. You know, the nose horn lizard. But it has brow horns too. So get that. Fix that, movie makers. Uh, did I forget? Yeah, come on. Did I forget an E in year? Oh, whatever. I'm just going to go ahead and pretend that I wrote this whole slideshow when I was drunk. So take that. (laughs) You would never do that. Dinosaurs don't. I mean, goblins don't get drunk. Goblins probably do get drunk. Dinosaurs do. I know from a firsthand experience. Yes, so. All right. And then we come to a movie that is not very good. Well, the last one wasn't all that great either. But 1978's Planet of Dinosaurs. It's primarily famous for its excellent stop motion and for its completely crappy everything else. (laughs) I'm not kidding. The movie 
the director intentionally spent nearly all of the movie's budget on stop motion and almost none on props or costuming or pay for the actors, one of whom claimed to have never actually been paid what she was owed. In fact, they skimped so much on pay for actors that they actually didn't have enough in the production budget to pay the actors what they promised, and they asked the actors to take a deferment of pay until after the movie came out, hoping that they could pay what they owe the actors from the proceeds of the movie. So the final production of the movie was actually bigger than the amount of money that they spent making it. Somehow. Okay. Very crazy. But the plot That's is... Weird, yeah. yeah, the plot is that there's a space transport ship flying through space, and they have some kind of weird engine malfunction, you know, as spaceships do. And uh, they land, or they crash into a lake on an alien planet that happens to be full of dinosaurs for reasons. I mean, <clears throat> why not, right? Planet of Dinosaurs. Sure. It's the 70s. What do you, whatever. But the thing is that aliens can't be dinosaurs, because dinosauria is a clade and it's from Earth. So any aliens that evolved, even if they evolved to look kind of like dinosaurs, wouldn't actually be dinosaurs, and they probably wouldn't look that much like dinosaurs either. Like, you could get aliens that approximate certain, certain dinosaur body plans, I suppose, but they wouldn't be identifiable genus, genuses or species from Earth that you would get. So, <clears throat> but uh, we also have uh, a sauropod eating ground cover like grass. Uh, sauropods were primarily browsers, uh, either for low-lying shrubs or for trees, but they generally were not grazers. So that's a little bit of a problem. Also, sauropods definitely didn't eat grass because there was no grass around the time that sauropods were around, except for the very latest sauropods. But even then, the area that they lived in, grass really hadn't colonized yet. So, sauropods essentially didn't even encounter grass, never mind eat it. Um, so, uh, on screen is a Tyrannosaurus from the movie, and the scales on the Tyrannosaurus, and really a lot of the dinosaurs, are way too big. Uh, we actually have scale impressions from Tyrannosaurus, and the scales are all very small, only a few millimeters across. So, at this distance, a, a Tyrannosaurus skin would have just looked smooth. You wouldn't be able to tell that there were scales, really, at this distance. Um, you can kind of see the head here if I lean out of the way of this Stegosaurus right here. I don't know. Uh, but it's it's way too big. Way too big. And the uh, spikes on the Thagomizer are point up. They point uh, dorsally. They should point laterally. Because uh, Stegosaurus didn't have a lot of up and down flexibility in its tail. But it could swing it side to side. So if you have spikes pointed up, it's hard to actually bring them to bear against targets when you can't really twist your tail much and you can't move it up and down. But if you can go side to side, then laterally sp splayed spikes work just great. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. The Centrosaurus didn't have any scutes. So uh, Centrosaurus is an animal like a Triceratops. And uh, Ceratopsians pretty commonly had these um, these big sort of hexagonal shaped scales, but they didn't have big bony scutes like armor plates on the, uh, on the skin and Centrosaurus in this movie does. Uh, also the Ornithomimids, and I'm presuming that they were Ornithomimids cause I don't know what else they would have been. And Ornithomimus is things like Gallimimus that you might remember from, um, Jurassic Park, the one that had that flock that ran away from the Tyrannosaurus and, uh, Grant and the kid Timmy got caught up in the stampede. Uh, that's a, an, or, an ornithomimid. I can't talk today. But yeah, they had these weird sinuous necks that could flex all over the place. And ornithomimids probably had reasonably flexible necks, but not, not that flexible. They weren't snakes. They also lacked a beak. We know ornithomimids had beaks. It's one of the reasons that they're called ornithomimids, which means bird mimics. So, yeah. And um, hmm. also, uh, let's see. Ugly German Truths. Dinotopia is coming. I'm going to cover Dinotopia. So don't worry. But yeah, um, I honestly can't really recommend you go out and try to find Planet of the Dinosaurs unless you really, really like uh, schlocky 70s B-movies. If you do, then it's a fine one. Um, yeah, not, not really a big recommendation from me. It's... 
<sighs> it's not so bad that it's funny, but it's also not so good that it's really worth watching. So I don't know. Do what you want. But then we come to a movie that is straight out of pretty much everyone's childhood, I feel like. The Land Before Time from 1988, featuring the likes of Ducky, Sarah, Spike, Littlefoot, and Petrie, which are all pictured. And um, first I'm going to say this is a great movie. It's a nice kids movie. Uh, it has a, sort of a heartbreaking bit at the end, and then there's some heartwarming stuff as you go through. It's a tale of developing friendship between Friends who normally would have been kept separated by their families and society all coming together in a time of crisis to band together and survive and reach the promised land of the movie, the Great Valley, which is um, because the movie is depicted as being set some time of uh, significant drying and volcanic activity in an unspecified time of long, long ago. And um, yeah, the, the group are trying to find their way to this legendary place that's like the last um, the last place that has significant amounts of green growth. So, And the whole way there, they're being pursued by a Tyrannosaurus. One eye. Only got one eye. An evil Tyrannosaurus. Well, yeah. I mean, it wants to eat them, so, you know. How dare it. Exactly. Uh, so, <clears throat> there are a few problems though with the dinosaurs and i'm giving this a bit of slack for being a cartoon so for instance um in other movies i would hit on things like uh the dinosaurs have lips that move around but this is a cartoon where these uh characters need to be expressive in a way that reads well to human audiences so i get why they do that and i'm not gonna say that that's an inaccuracy even though technically it is but it's one of those things where like it's just a product of the medium um and the sort of the the idea of the plot and yes, Dark Knight Apologetics. Cartoons are awesome. I, I like cartoons. Cartoons are cool. But there are some serious problems that can't be excused by simply saying that this is a cartoon. For instance, um, the Hadrosaur and Pterosaur crests are depicted like mammal horns, where they have like a root that they grow out of, and then they're just covered with horn. Uh, no, those were actual bony projections, and if they even if they were covered in keratin, they wouldn't grow out of some little ring-shaped basin like a rhino horn. Just... Not how that would have gone. Um, so let's see. Uh, it also puts together animals from all sorts of different times. So like Ducky is from the Jurassic period. Petrie is also from the Jurassic period. But uh, and Sarah's from the Jurassic period. Or sorry. I'm screwing things up. So Ducky, Sarah, and Petrie are all Cretaceous animals. There we go. Whereas Spike and Littlefoot are Jurassic animals. And the whole movie has just a hodgepodge of just dinosaurs from different eras. It's got Nankylosaurus, which is Cretaceous. It's got, um, it seems to have, if I remember correctly, some smaller sharp teeth that are uh, Jurassic. And yeah, it's it's a bit of a confusing mess. Uh, very early on, it even seems to have some like Triassic or like late Permian uh amphibians because it opens underwater and there are these little amphibians swimming around but a lot of them look like very primitive like temnospondyls from the paleozoic and so yeah it's it's got that problem of this is the land of prehistory where all the prehistoric animals can just show up uh let's see uh sarah doesn't have any brow horns despite being a triceratops and triceratops were born with brow horns we have juvenile triceratops and their brow horns are long enough that they couldn't have been a post-hatching feature. I don't think we have any fetal triceratops, but yeah, it's pretty well established that even a newly hatched triceratops would have brow horns. Let's see. Uh, sauropods probably didn't care for their young either. One of the core elements of the story is the relationship between Littlefoot and his mother, and then, spoilers, she dies. Sorry if you haven't seen it. But if you haven't seen Land Before Time by now, like what what's wrong with you? Well, now but um, the reason you spoiled it. right. So it shows a lot of parental care between her and I think her father and Littlefoot. Um, and yeah, Ugly German Truth says they probably thought that kids would only know dinosaurs from their toy drawer, and that that was also a hodgepodge. 
including lots of prehistoric mammals um, that would be way younger than dinosaurs. That's true. Uh, and that's probably why they did it, but I'm still going to hit it because they didn't have to. They could have picked famous dinosaurs from a single period. And yeah, thanks for ruining your weekend. Sorry, Bob. Uh, so yeah, dinos- sauropods probably didn't care for their young. It seems like the young were laid at the edges of forests in nests that were dug out by the female, and then they would go into the forest for protection while they grew until they were too big to fit in the forest, and then they would move out, now having grown large enough to defend themselves from most predators. Um, and sauropods seem to be a, the sort of animal that would lay a lot of eggs and hope that some of them made it to adulthood. And yeah, how dare I spoil a 31-year-old movie? <laughs> exactly. Uh, the feet the feet are just terrible all across the movie. They all look like elephant feet. It's just, it's not good. They have the wrong number of toes. Uh, if you look at Littlefoot, like I said before, um, they the toes play out. Uh, Littlefoot should really only have at most one toenail or claw, and the other toes shouldn't ex- have any claws at all. They shouldn't in some, depending on exactly which kind of sauropod he is, they might not even exist. Uh, a lot of the legs are splayed out. Littlefoot's leg is splayed out. Um, Sarah's legs being splayed, the reconstructions on Triceratops goes a little bit back and forth as to whether or not the uh, forelimbs were splayed and to what degree. So we're going to kind of give it to them there, like, eh, not too bad. But, um, uh, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Oh. I really like that Littlefoot's mom hits the tra- the sharp tooth with her tail because that is a, pre- a pretty reasonable um, thing for a sauropod to do in a combat situation. That was probably their easiest uh, weapon because it do- didn't have to support their weight. So the problem with kicking is that it's uh, a bit unstable. Because for a sauropod, if you fall over, that's you're probably never getting up again. And so kicking is a dangerous activity because it unbalances you. So uh, I really liked that was her primary weapon was a, a big tail slam that slammed the Tyrannosaurus into a wall and then it kind of fell off a cliff. Really good. That's a that's a bit of praise for the accuracy in the movie. Um, but the teeth in the Triceratops go way too far anteriorly. The Triceratops teeth came in a battery that was at the back of the dentary bone. And uh, in this movie, the teeth go all the way up to basically the edge of the beak. And nope. Mm-mm. And you can see them because... With the movable lips, they often make expressions where you can see the teeth. So, uh, <clears throat> The T-Rex head in the movie is also basically shaped like a box, but T-Rex heads narrowed significantly towards the snout so that the eyes could face forward for binocular vision. And the T-Rex has also eyes on the side of its head, which it shouldn't. The eyes should face forward, not to the side, because um, that gave it good binocular vision so it could judge distance for things like strikes. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, the pteranodons that are depicted like Petrie and his family, they're all depicted as herbivores. They're all eating things like cherries and, uh, pteranodons ate fish. So. In fact, I know of no pterosaur that is likely to have been an herbivore. There were a few filter feeders. But for the most part, they were all either insectivores, piscivores, or they hunted smallish animals like uh, smallish dinosaurs or mammals. So, yeah. Uh, Petri should not be eating cherries or leaves. So, mm -mm, not okay. But that's me nitpicking. Part of the reason I'm doing this is because I'm going to nitpick on some movies. There's been over a century of dinosaurs in films. And what I know most about dinosaurs in films is how badly wrong they are. So, but it's still a great movie. Um, if your kids haven't seen it, show it to your kids. Um, yeah, scar them for life with the death of Littlefoot's mom. I recommend it. They'll need therapy, probably. Oh, I don't know. I didn't. But now we get to the movie that took the dinosaur renaissance out of the pages of paleontology books and put it into the public eye and then left that view of dinosaurs for decades with no chance of anyone ever catching up on new paleontology because all they wanted was Jurassic Park dinosaurs. Yeah. So it was a great advance for the public image of dinosaurs and accuracy at the time, and it has since become sort of a curse. I I don't know. 
Um, and yeah, ugly German truths. Yeah, Deinonychus. We'll get to that. So as you can see, even in this picture, which I can crouch down a little bit, yeah, the wrists are wrong on pretty much every dinosaur. And I wasn't really hitting on that in other movies because it wasn't clear to paleontologists at the time that that was wrong. But by this time, paleontologists were beginning to realize that, yeah, the uh, hands of most dinosaurs were locked into this orientation and they couldn't do this. So, yeah, the fact that they do it in Jurassic Park is kind of annoying because that's now how everyone pictures the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park is that way. When you say a velociraptor, people picture this thing. They don't picture the actual animal that was probably only about this tall and was fully feathered and that didn't hold its hands like this. It had them like this. It could even rotate them down significantly. Uh, hands going. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's see. The Brachiosaurus that appears and like it's the first dinosaur you see. And, you know, Alan Grant gets out of the truck and he pulls off his glasses and he's like going to collapse on the ground. And, uh, you know, John Hammond says, Dr. Grant, my dear Dr. Sadler, welcome to Jurassic Park. And the music swells and you see the Brachiosaurus. Yeah, way too big. It's a great scene. Great shot. The pan up, the reveal. The CGI in that scene doesn't hold up as well as it does in some of the other parts of the movie, but still, it's a great bit. But yeah, too big. Uh, the, the Velociraptors, which you have up here, um, way too big. And really, they're Deinonychus, and they're still too big for Deinonychus. And even though the movie depicts Dr. Grant digging at a site in Montana, which is in North America, Velociraptor is Velociraptor mongoliensis. It's the only Velociraptor species. Ben, do you know what mongoliensis means? It means it's from Mongolia. Yeah, that's right. Yes! Exactly. Now, is, Mongo right. is Montana in Mongolia or not? I don't remember. They both start with Mon, and that's like as similar as it gets okay. after that. So mm -hmm. Montana isn't part of Mongolia. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, let's see. Also, that great scene where Alan Grant covers up... Uh, what's the girl's name? Oh, I don't remember the character names. Whatever. He covers up the, the girl's mouth because she's about to scream when the T-Rex is going to come and get them. And he's like, don't move. It can't see if if we don't move. T-Rex's vision is based on movement. No. Mm -mm. No. There is no good reason to think that T-Rex's vision was based on movement. Dinosaurs, modern dinosaurs generally have excellent vision, whether it's motion or not. And uh, there's no good reason to think that a predatory dinosaur that's already fairly closely related to birds would have such poor eyesight. Um, so, yeah. T-Rex could almost certainly see you whether or not you moved. In fact, I don't know of any animals that can only perceive things that are moving. Um, yeah. So, uh, Nikki, which ones don't? You're going to have to be a little bit more specific. I'm not sure which ones don't what. So, yeah, let ask that. Um, let's see. So, at the time of the movie, the idea of dinosaurs having feathers, including things like Velociraptor, was still a little bit uh, up in the air. There was a growing consensus that birds were dinosaurs, so it was known that some of them must have had feathers, but which ones did and which ones didn't was not well understood. And um, the the conservative hypothesis, um, oh, which modern dinosaurs don't have excellent vision? Um, basically, gr some ground-dwelling dinosaurs don't have terribly good vision. Uh, I don't think the kiwi is particularly keen with the whole vision thing. Um, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, Dark Knight Project says there are some species of frogs that have movement based vision. That may be, uh, but it's not a very common trait. But anyway, um, the reason I'm going to complain about it is not because it was super inaccurate at the, in 1993, but because all of the Jurassic Park films stuck with this. They were all just like, nope, no feathers. And Hey Neil, um, yeah, just no feathers anywhere. And the problem is that many of the dinosaurs that they're depicting were, in fact, very fully feathered, like this, uh, these velociraptors. And the problem is that because this, because Jurassic Park is sort of the touchstone for the public consciousness about how dinosaurs look, keeping that inaccuracy going means that people think that dinosaurs looked other than how they did. And it bugs me a little bit. Uh, and last, the Dilophosaurus, the one that kills uh, Dennis Nedry, uh, Newman for you uh, Seinfeld fans 
uh, yeah, it's it's way too small. It should have been significantly taller than Newman, and it should not have been able to fit in a Jeep. Yeah. Uh, also, the jaw shape is badly wrong. It looks like its mouth sort of looks like a Velociraptor mouth. It shouldn't have looked like that. It should have had a little uh, downward kink at the premaxilla. So, yeah, the... Um, the Dilophosaurus is just a mess as far as the, the movie goes. I'm not going to complain about the spitting or the uh, frills because those probably wouldn't have shown up in any Dilophosaurus finds. So it's speculative and unlikely. I can't technically say it's definitely wrong. And yeah, they retconned it to say it's because of frog DNA, but I, I don't care, honestly. The fact is that these movies continue to be how most of the public sees these animals. And it is increasingly wrong as time goes on. So fix it. Jurassic world producers who are never, ever going to see this and won't, wouldn't care even if they did, because what my audience of 30 people is not going to, what are they, what are you going to do? You tweet at them? No. <laughs> so they're never going to listen to me, but that's okay. And now we get to the 2000s. We're out of the 20th century into 21st century depictions of dinosaurs in film with the Dinotopia miniseries. Now, I will admit, I have only ever seen the first episode of this movie series or this miniseries of which I believe there are three episodes, and I saw it 2 days ago, and I did it <laughs> solely because of this live stream. So, when I was a kid, I read some of the books. They were okay. Uh, yeah, they weren't even as a kid they were like, oh, these are fun books, but like they're not, weren't super great. But that's okay. Uh, let's see. So, I don't, if, in case anyone doesn't know, the idea behind Dinotopia is that it's sort of the nice version of Skull Island from King Kong, where there is this mysterious island that's hard to get to, essentially impossible to get out of, and it's full of late surviving dinosaurs for some reason. But rather than being a horrible land full of monsters that want to eat you, it's where there's nothing friendly and survival is dicey at best. It's a nice utopian land that's only a little bit full of monsters that want to eat you, and mostly not full of that, full of dinosaurs who are all of about human-level intelligence getting along with humans in a unified cross-species society. Um, so it's this miniseries was based on a series of books. The books are probably better than the miniseries, at least what I saw of it. But, um, yeah, there are, however, some problems with the depictions of the animals. For instance, the Ankylosaurus in the first episode, the, basically the first dinosaur, dinosaur you see is an Ankylosaurus rampaging through a little human settlement. And then this, this woman here shows up, calms it down, and then pulls a tooth out of it by hand, which I, I don't think you can really pull teeth out of animals by hand unless they're already She's about to come out. She's very strong. Yeah, apparently. But she says, oh, it's a toothache. And she holds up this gigantic molar looking tooth. But Ankylosaurus teeth were actually fairly small and closely packed. So, um, and, uh, Jacolo 666. Yeah. You know what? Go to Dinotopia and you can have a T-Rex wife. Because one of the plot elements is that humans in Dinotopia get a dinosaur life partner as a spiritual soulmate or something. I don't know. Uh, let's see. So, and yeah, the Ankylosaurus teeth would drop out regularly because uh, dinosaurs were polyphodont. They, their teeth were replaced continuously. Uh, let's see. Um, also, the movie shows a lot of uh, hadrosaurs that look like they're Parasaurolophus, but they're way too small, and they all walk on just two legs. And I think... Part of the reason for this is to give them a bit more of a human-like characteristic so that they look like something that has two arms and two legs, and so they're a bit more relatable. But it's still badly off. Uh, let's see. The Brachiosaurus. We had a Brachiosaurus that in Jurassic Park was too big. Well, in this show, they're too small, and I don't get why you would do that, but they did. The Brachiosaurus in this is, like, barely bigger than an elephant, and it's just like, what... Are these babies? I don't know. But, yeah. Uh, it, it was a little weird. Um, they have too many claws in their front feet, which is a common problem with uh, depictions of a lot of dinosaurs, really. But especially with sauropods. Generally speaking, sauropods should only have 
one claw and it's a thumb claw and it should stick in towards the middle. And a lot of later sauropods didn't even have that. They had no claws. In fact, they didn't even have phalanges. They just had metacarpals and they stood on their metacarpals. So, yeah. That sounds painful. Well, probably not for them, but Yeah, they were they were well adapted to it. Uh, once again, the theropod wrists are just like the Jurassic Park wrists. You get the bunny wrist problem. Stop doing this, movie makers. Do this. No? Yes. No? Yes. Okay. Uh, we get naked uh, pterosaurs. So pterosaurs in life were actually covered with a down-like fuzz that's called pycnofibers, and it would have looked a lot like fur. But the pterosaurs in this movie... In 2005, when there's no excuse for that, because 2005, um, yeah, everyone should have known, or the scientists knew at least, that pterosaurs were covered in pycnofibers. Uh, it's as for my hands being shaky, I don't, I don't know. Is it, uh, but anyway, uh, they also have the elephant-shaped feet where the, the foot is sort of circular and there's a big flesh pad in the middle, but actual sauropod forelimbs actually had a, sort of a horseshoe shape. So, you know, basically all uh, sauropods, even the ones that had phalanges, the weight was primarily borne at the uh, distal end of the metacarpals. So walking around on knuckles, basically. And those metacarpals formed a semicircular whoop, and we have sauropod tracks, and we know that that's the shape that they were in. They were in a horseshoe shaped. There isn't a big fleshy pad underneath these metacarpals. It's just flesh-covered metacarpals in a semicircle. So, uh, oh, and I forgot, the, the pterosaurs also have torsos that are bigger than their heads. Uh, that's basically never right. Uh, as a general rule of thumb for pterosaur portions, the torso should be smaller than the head. Just, there you go. At most people, they're very weird proportions for any animal to have. But for pterosaurs, yeah. Uh, a very common problem with pterosaur depictions is gigantic torsos. And this miniseries does it extremely badly. Uh, let's see. The stegosaurus head was way too big. Which is a common problem because the stegosaurus head is almost comically small if you actually look at it. Um, I think part of that was just to make it look like something that could reasonably be as intelligent as a human. So, uh, the carnivores made lion and tiger noises. I don't, I don't know why, but they were literally just audio samples from lions and tigers, especially tigers. That's, that's probably why they had access to those samples. Yeah. I mean, that's true, but, uh, dinosaurs almost certainly did not roar. And even if they did, they didn't do it in a way that would be recognizably a tiger. So stop that. I'll well, give Jurassic they Park this. They didn't roar though. Well, they probably did things like honked and chirped. Like birds. Yeah. So, um, at least Jurassic Park used some roars, but they didn't just simply take actual real-world animal roars. They actually mixed their own noises. So, if you have to make dinosaurs roar, mix a roar yourself that's a combination of several animals so that it's not identifiably just a tiger. Tyrannosaurus should never sound like a tiger. Stop it. Yes. Yeah, also, it. what the heck is Zippo? That's this green guy here who's this woman's arm is around him. If you have ideas, let me know. He's got four fingers, three toes, no first digit. So he's just got to just uh, two, three, four on his feet. So he doesn't have dew claws. He doesn't have a beak. He's got flat teeth. I don't know what he is. I can't even tell you if he's accurate or not because he's not an identifiable dinosaur. It seems like this entire animal was just made up to have a significantly more human-like dinosaur than the other ones. Yeah, I guess maybe a dino-human hybrid. I it it don't make no sense. And I uh, apparently I put naked pterosaurs again cuz it, it must have bugged me. The pterosaurs were very naked. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> it's indecent. To get it's getting X rating. Not always. Right. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Um, yeah, so stop that. Uh, so you think this was a telesaurid crocodiliform? Oh, 
Okay, so he's not a dinosaur. Uh, Steniosaurus. I, I don't know that one, but then again, I'm not super up on my crocodile forms. So, yeah, and he definitely kind of acts like a Jar Jar Binks. And, yeah, it's... <sighs> <laughs> so a chicken, a human, a lizard went out for a drink. They got a bit too many, and things got wild, and that's how Zippo was born. Yep, that sounds about right. Um, also, this... Uh, I'm not entirely sure exactly which genus this is supposed to be, but uh, it suffers from some similar problems to the sauropods. Uh, the... The first three toes on a ceratopsian should have claws, but then the other two should go back anteriorly and get smaller and not have claws. But, yeah. Uh, overall, as far as would I recommend it, um, I've only seen the first episode, but it wasn't terribly engaging, and a lot of the Dinotopia, like, the codes of Dinotopia or whatever are a bit cringe-inducing. Um, it seems like it's clearly made for kids, but even then, I, I don't know how many kids want to hear about, like, pol political dynamics of a fictional dinosaur island. So I can't really recommend it very strongly. But that's okay, because we're going to end on an extremely low note. And that is Walking with Dinosaurs 2013. So, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but in the, uh, in the 2000s, the BBC made a great series of documentary style movies about dinosaurs called Walking with Dinosaurs. There was an attempt to make them rigorously accurate. They were broadly successful, uh, although they suffer from a lack of feathers problem. But yeah, it was a fun show. And um, at this point, you know, the CGI is showing its age. It's no longer as convincing as it once was. But anyway, <clears throat> in 2013, the BBC released a feature-length uh, movie called Walking with Dinosaurs 3D, which was filmed in 3D on a combination of real locations augmented with CGI with CGI dinosaurs that were actually pretty darn accurate. Um, the CG had a little stylistic choices that I thought brought me out of the film a little bit, but... That's not important, really. One of the big problems, though, was that in the United States, Fox got a hold of the distribution rights. Uh, yeah, so it actually wasn't the BBC who screwed this up. It was Fox in the United States who decided that this non-narrated, non-voiceover work story about a Pachyrhinosaurus traveling through Alaska to get south to get to warmer climes needed annoying kids voicing all of the characters who weren't animated to be speaking. So you just get <laughs> kids' voices talking about the things that the dinosaurs are doing as if they're the dinosaur, and they never shut up. Ever. And there are also bits where clearly there's been some re-editing done to make this plot have more plot elements than it used to. So at one point, our hero, Pachyrhinosaurus, meets a female from a different herd, and then we get several uses of the same shots of him showing up to where he first met her and her not being there, so that we can have this unrequited love story for no reason. And yeah, it's almost all of the voices are children, and, or at least as far as I could watch, because I'll be honest, I only got about 20 minutes into this, and then I turned it off. <laughs> so I'm gonna I gotta be honest about that. It's it's aggressively bad. Like it takes its badness and it shoves it down your throat as you're watching it. It's just terrible. I would like to see the BBC version, but I haven't been able to find it because I bet that is actually a pretty decent movie. Thanks, Fox. Right. And also, every time a new species of dinosaur comes up, a little. The film freezes, a little CGI nameplate pops up that gives you the genus name, the meaning for the genus name, and its diet uh, broken into carnivore, herbivore, and um, omnivore. But it's also narrated 
by some annoying four-year-old. Yeah. So, like, Troodon will show up, and it'll freeze on Troodon, and then the words will appear, and some kid will say, Troodon! Name means wounding tooth! Omnivore! <laughs> and then the action proceeds, with annoying voiceover. It's, is it, like, scripted voiceover? Yeah. Yes, it is. Like, how, how accurate do you think they are to the script? Oh, I have no idea. I haven't seen the script. Okay. So... Um, does it sound like the kids are making up their own lines or words every other word or something like that? In a that? few places, but overall, it's it seems like someone wrote those lines, but not someone but who still, really cared much. So, but still, it's yeah. annoying kids. Yeah, it's voicing dinosaurs. If you're gonna moving. if you're gonna watch this movie, try to get a hold of the BBC copy. Apparently, there was a worldwide release of the BBC version of this on Blu-ray a few years ago. If you're going to watch it, I recommend trying to get that copy. Um, but I will say the reconstructions are pretty excellent on virtually every animal. Uh, the pterosaurs are furry. There's an, an antiornithine bird that looks quite good, if a little bit chicken-like, but not in ways that I could say are definitely um, inaccurate. Uh, the Manoraptor in feathering is a bit sparse and not aerodynamic, which is a little bit off, but I believe that was probably a budgetary constraint because it's very hard to get excellent feathers. Feathers are really complicated things to do in CGI. Um, so I see why that was why that was done. Um, but yeah, like I've said, aggressively bad voice acting. It wasn't meant to have voice acting at all. It shouldn't. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the CGI things. Uh, there's a few areas where it seems a little bit too plasticky, like... Um, Maybe they should have toned down the subsurface scattering and upped the variation in the uh, spec maps or roughness maps. I don't know which uh, workflow they were using. But, uh, and I don't know, maybe it's just that I'm a bad CGI dinosaur myself in most of my videos. I get picky about that. So, eh, you know. Uh, ultimately, having never seen this before, I was... I, as someone who really enjoyed the original series when I was younger, the Walking with Dinosaurs, I was hopeful to have a really good Walking with Dinosaurs movie. But, yeah, that's not what happened. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's called CGI. It's faster and cheaper than real sets. That's the only reason it's used in Hollywood. Yeah, it is sad that now, in many cases, CGI is the cheaper option than doing things practically. Back when that wasn't the case, when CGI was expensive and things were still done practically for the most part, uh, visual effects held up better. Yeah, They just did. CGI is what you should use when you can't use anything else. Why do I use CGI for my videos? Well, because what is my other option? If I, I want... mean, you could just put a, a camera on your big old dinosaur body. I guess I could do that. Maybe I'll do How that. Do how do you reach the camera when you're... I would have to get my stuff. butler to do it. I don't know. If your butler's willing, I don't know if he's able. And I can't um, tell you how I know that. Yeah, so... The quality of the CGI is not super great, but the reconstructions themselves are actually pretty good. They're pretty accurate. And that is the nicest thing I can say about this, is very accurate dinosaurs, very, very bad movie making. So, yeah. Um... Watch it if you can get a hold of the BBC version. Don't watch it if all you can get is the voice-acted American release. Please don't do that to yourself. You'll you'll regret it. But um, I think that that is going to be it. Uh, ben, do you have anything you want to plug? Um, well, I was going to mention there have been 14 Land Before Time movies. Maybe uh, in like 2021, there'll be a 15th. We could have another movie. I've Whoa, seen there you Godzilla. Go. I've seen The Land Before Time and Jurassic Park. Those are the only three of these that I've seen. So, okay. um, yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> now, is there Copper Magma news? Yeah, there is. We just played our first show since June today, and I literally got home four minutes before this live stream started. Okay. So it was a lot of fun. Um, outdoor show. Nice. Everyone, if you want, open up a new tab. Go to your address bar, type in Copper Magma, then hold Control, press Enter. That'll take you to coppermagma.com. 
download the music. It's free. There you go. Free. We're not asking for any money. We just want to spread the music. It's there you our go. art. And if you watch the Seabed show, you hear a little bit of it. Um, yep. You also hear a little bit of uh, it on. Yeah. Sorry. The Seabed show. But. Um... Uh, and some of the, like the intro music on this video is going to be a Copper Magma song. It's written. It's just not recorded yet. There you go. So um, that was like a bedroom recording I made. So anyway, uh, that. I'll well, plug that. Yeah, it's nothing to do with dinosaurs, but it's what Doesn't I matter. do in my life when I'm not doing these videos with the Dapper Dino. Um, aren't there dinosaurs in quote dinosaurs in Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow? I don't know actually. I haven't seen that movie, so I can't comment on that. Um, I don't have a whole lot to plug other than you know, um, I'm averaging about fifty-ish hours a day, which means I'm probably about two weeks away from my monetization review. So if you want to help. Uh, thank you, Maya, for posting the link to coppermagma.com. If you want to help with that, just watch my videos, put on one of my playlists in the background or something while you're, like, cooking dinner or getting, playing a video game or whatever you, whatever you do, put it on there. Uh, so, yeah, that, watching those will help. Uh, share, you know, stuff like that. Um, the other thing is, as I said earlier, uh, Chesh was supposed to be on this live stream, but she is not feeling well, and so she couldn't make it. So if you have Twitter and you feel so inclined, please send her some get well soon messages, because I think she would probably appreciate having people be friendly to her on Twitter, rather than just having a bunch of trolls on Twitter, because that's mostly what she does on Twitter. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I'm going to send her a get well soon uh, tweet after this. The only other thing I can say is that um, I am going to be moderating a debate on Eric Viertaler's channel. Uh, ben, if you could find that channel and link it, or Maya maybe, that would be great. So that is going to be coming at uh, in an hour and a half, actually. I'm going to be moderating a debate there. It's going to be uh, one creationist versus uh, Eric and his friend. So there you go. Uh, actually, Henry, she is no longer in Twitter jail. They finally let her out of Twitter jail. So, finally. Unless she's back in. Uh, so it's on Eric Viertaler's uh, channel. Ben, do you have any? I just uh, linked There it. you go. So there's Eric Viertaler's channel. Uh, I'm just the moderator. I'm not the. De I'm not going to be in the debate. So, you know, it's going to be mostly the debaters talking. But, uh, yeah. I may or may not be mirroring that debate on my channel after a while. I'm not sure. I'll ask Eric uh, if he's okay with that because we haven't really set that up. But that's the other thing I'm going to be um, uh, oh, plugging. You know what? I don't know if that was his main channel or not. Oh. I think there's supposed to be a 92 at the end of it. Um, do I get to eat the All loser? Right. I hope so. Well, I'm I, hungry. I linked the wrong one. Let me link the correct channel. Oh, okay. So uh, Ben's okay, getting the right better. channel. There you go. There's yeah, the right sorry channel. Sorry about that. I'm pretty sure that's good. Um, so, yeah. This will actually be my first publicly moderated debate. Uh, or, well, this will be my first time moderating a public debate. It's, there you go. Um, so, yeah. That's all I've got for plugging on my end. And uh, thank you all for watching. I'm going to get out of here. And, uh, yep. Remember, come see me debate in a little bit or see me moderate a debate and send Chesh some good vibes on Twitter and visit Copper Magma, get some sludge metal. Free music. Free, music. Free downloads. If you hate it, then you can just delete it, right? You're not, you didn't pay any money for it, but if you love it, you can keep it. You didn't pay any money for it. There you go. How would you tell me to that? You first, first, first. How would you tell me to that? Well, if there's a question, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.